you know, w whatever genius thought they'd put the full team to work on this one, bringing in the the, the king of Holland, Holland uh, King Willy, to you know uh, talk about uh, crystal Nacht and what have you. Uh, it was a, an absolutely dopey idea. Uh, so I don't know what their underlying agenda there is, but I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, you, you mentioned that story, uh, which is a year old now. Uh, they uh, forty. I, I, I wrote forty beheaded babies survived the Hamas attack, and it, uh, that that uh, that that what we knew uh, at the time was this was preparation for a genocide. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I've got the great pleasure of talking to a journalist and personal friend, Eugene Doyle. Eugene is a writer based in Wellington, New Zealand, who has written extensively on the Middle East as well as peace and security issues in Asia-Pacific region. Last weekend, Eugene penned an article on the then ongoing events in Amsterdam, where Israeli football hooligans vandalized parts of the city and in turn got beaten up, which then large parts of the media started portraying as a pro-Rome against Jews. Eugene entitled this, The BBC Goes Full Goebbels. That and the broken state of Western media and how media influences us to go to war is what we will discuss today. So, Eugene, welcome. Hey, thanks, Pascal. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. My first time on neutrality studies, but I'm a, I'm a devoted follower. So, so great to be here. Thank you for that. And we've met just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we've had time to, uh, to exchange and engage. And then you reached out to me saying like, what is happening right now with this Amsterdam story is so outrageous. You just had to write uh, something pointed about it. Can you maybe walk us through what you think that the, that what was what was happening in the media with Amsterdam is reminiscent of what Goebbels did in Germany in uh, sec yeah. uh, in in Nazi Germany. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't normally trot that word Goebbels out lightly, but but uh, you'll you'll see there's a very good reason for it. So let's let's start with the way the BBC presented it because the BBC's got this oversized influence. If the BBC says it or the New York Times says it, they're framing tends to go all around the world. So that's important. So the first I became aware of this, I saw, I saw a BBC headline uh, that said, uh, we must not turn blind eye to anti-Semitism, says Dutch King, after attacks on Israeli football fans. So that was the, that, that was, whoa, okay, what's happened? And uh, let's tell their story. So the the way they framed it was this was an anti-Semitic attack on Israeli football fans. And um, then in their story, and, and you must remember in the hierarchy of news, you know, if you're a journalist, day one, you learn, you put the big stuff first, you put the most important stuff up up, up the top. Um, and that's what they did. So so we heard from the, the Dutch king and how concerned he was and the shadow of, 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 of the Second World War and the treatment of uh, uh, the Jews in Europe, you know, very serious, obviously. Uh, we, we, we heard that the uh, Dutch uh, prime minister was so concerned by what had happened, he flew back from overseas. We heard there were planes scrambled uh, in Israel to following the, these attacks. Um, and... Uh, it, it went, went on in that kind of uh, vein. And uh, it, it, and then the BBC itself, oh, and we had President uh, uh, Biden wading into the story and, you know, uh, all, all of this. But then the BBC, and it was the reporter who did this, said, said and I'll quote you, uh, the violence on Thursday night was condemned by leaders across Europe, the US and Israel. For many, it was especially shocking coming on the eve of commemorations marking Kristallnacht, the 1938 Nazi pogroms against German Jews. And it was like, holy smoke. OK, that's a pretty big that's a pretty big linkage to actually link uh, 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 an incident uh, involving football fans and uh the victims of the Holocaust to to actually use the the Holocaust and link it to this event. So let's let's hit the uh, pause button. The referee blows the whistles. We go upstairs. We look at the TMO, the T 
technical match official and will replay the footage. And of course, as a number of people have done really well, you know, uh, Owen Jones and Navarra Media and others, when you when you actually look at what happened, here's what here's what actually happened. The the Maccabee, that's that's uh, the football team from Tel Aviv. The Maccabee team arrive in uh, Amsterdam. They gather. Uh, they they uh, turn up in a square. Uh, there's a lot of sort of random violence, you know, like there's a, a number of uh, taxi drivers, Uber drivers getting beaten up. I mean, it's just standard behaviour. They do this all over Europe. Um, and and uh, there's footage. You can see all this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this, uh, you know, ripping down Palestinian flags from people's private homes, uh, you know, all, 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 all of this kind of carry on. And... Um, they're also chanting. So what, what the BBC um, sort of obliquely referred to um, is this. I'll, I'll read you. Oh, and by the way, I've, I've got to say, you know, I, I, I think uh, the BBC scored an own goal with their coverage of this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm horrified to say the, the Times of Israel actually slotted one into the back of the net uh, by, by actually just telling the truth a little bit better. They, they, they had a headline that said, you know, uh, uh, Maccabee fans uh, chanting uh, racist slogans against, uh, 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 chants against um, Arabs. And uh, they, they were singing some of their favourite hits. And, and, and I'll just uh, read you uh, what, what they did in Amsterdam, uh, both in the squares in the stadium and and then on the plane flying back home. There's footage of all of this. You can see all this. So one of them is IDF, you know, the Israeli Defense Force. IDF will fuck the Arabs. And another uh, of their favorites is, why is school out in Gaza? There are no kids left. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Why is school out in Gaza? There are no kids left. Now, just the worst the, of the worst. This is this is as bad as it gets. It's genocidal language that you can imagine for like uh, taking joy in the eradication of children. Spot on, absolutely. Uh, I, I, so, so you and I, I think we would have framed the story slightly differently. So, mm -hmm. so according to the BBC, on the night of the football match. Uh, nothing would suggest, that's what they said, nothing would suggest what was to follow, the horror that was to follow. Well, actually, people who were at the stadium were a little horrified because there was a, a minute's silence, a minute's silence for the Spanish flood victims, the terrible floods that were in Spain. So there was a minute's silence that was drowned out by the Israelis chanting those words I just just, just read out to you. Right, and they weren't happy with the Spanish because the Spanish have uh, 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 they don't approve of their position on Israel. So, so all of that was the precursor to what followed, and then then there was all sorts of uh, fighting and chasing, and you know all sorts of violent behaviour. I, I don't condone any of it, but uh, I'd hardly say it's surprising. No, but the, the the fascinating thing is that this happened quickly, and then you quickly had this narrative emerge, and it went so far that even in German media. Uh, the the one the main like news uh, evening news outlet actually showed a video of people chasing other people with with sticks and 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 and, and, and beating them up and saying this is the Jews being beaten up and it it turns out a day later that these were the the Israeli football hooligans beating up uh, locals in in Amsterdam and they had to retract the story and then they posted a little apology yeah we got that wrong. But the, the overall narrative is out, right? And then the, the fight for uh, narrative dominance started and, and one side accusing the other one of being a horrible racist or, or, or anti-Semites for not acknowledging the program. I've re I read tweets of people who said, How, why do you still refuse using the word program? It's a program. And like... And as you said, the linkage with the Kristallnacht, which is regarded as the beginning of the systematic um, first incarceration and then extermination of the Jewish population of of uh, uh, of Europe, um, that is a huge one. Um, can you maybe speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, I, I, I was um, really offended when I saw that. In some ways, not surprised, but very disappointed. You know, I think... 
uh, people like Norman Finkelstein have written very eloquently on this for many years about the uh, the Holocaust industry and the, uh, the you know the really shameful use of the six million uh, to to actually promote uh, incredibly despicable behaviour here and now. And I have to say, I've been to Yad Vashem, uh, the Holocaust Memorial in Israel. I've stood in silence a number of times in, in, uh, in, in memory of those people. Uh, I stand in absolute solidarity. I actually had, um, uh, I'm old enough to have had uh, three really wonderful friends, Olga and Hans and Lisa, who were uh, Jewish people who fled the Nazis. And I can absolutely guarantee you uh, that they would uh, have joined me on any march uh, uh, for justice for Palestine because they were the absolute epitome of goodness and decency. Uh, you couldn't, couldn't hope for better people. And they are a million miles away, one million miles away from those racist hooligans, most of whom would have been IDF uh, uh, soldiers or reservists, and most certainly the, 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 those crowds don't go anywhere without a decent contingent of Mossad with them. Uh, they, they are uh, completely different people. And for, for the BBC to have the chutzpah, to have the audacity uh, to actually link the victims of the Holocaust with these thugs who are promoting genocide or violence against the Palestinians? I, I actually find uh, deeply offensive. Why why does that happen? And you said it yourself. The Times of Israel did a better job at actually reporting on on what happened. Why is it that so many huge news outlets in the West, like in Germany, in uh, in in the UK, in the US, feel the urge to 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 take an event, completely decontextualize it and recontextualize it in one of the worst atrocities that happened on the European continent in the in the 20th century. Uh, they don't have to do that. Nobody forces them. Nobody has a gun to their head. Yet they do it time and again and, I, and, I, I, and thereby I, justify the currently ongoing genocide. Why? Okay, I, I like your question. Why? What's going on here? And I, I think that's uh, actually a really good question. You've got to go, what is the real story here? You know, because sometimes we don't know. Sometimes the, the answer comes later. Uh, uh, where, where you say, why did the, um, uh, you know, an event... Uh, by the way, they taught you, you'd think this would have been some astonishing event. There were five of these people who uh, went to hospital uh, none of them stayed overnight. They, they, you know, all of them were uh, back on the plane having a grand old time. I saw all the footage of, of their racist chants on the aeroplane and uh, at uh, Ben Gurion Airport. So um, why was it that Joe Biden and Macron and Starmer and uh, if, and the BBC? You know, why, why was it that everyone was enlisted in this way? And I think simplistically it's because... Um, the collective West is part of a collective effort to actually get this business of genocide done in uh, in Gaza and Palestine. You know, I, I heard uh, uh, the Iranian uh, um, geopolitical analyst, uh, um, Mohammed uh, Sayed Mirandi, talking mm -hmm. the other day, and he said this thing that really sent a chill down my spine, but I couldn't disagree with him. He said... He felt that the Western countries, you know, including places like Australia and New Zealand, uh, they would stand back and allow the very last Palestinian to be exterminated in Gaza. And if the Israelis went after the West Bank, uh, they would do the same. And I have to say, I've got, I, I can see nothing in the West apart from all, you know, all the courageous uh, people who are out on street protesting, I'm, I'm referring to our governments, um, I can see nothing in the West that actually makes me think that uh, Professor Morandi is wrong. And, and that, that, yeah, that is quite frightening. Yeah, but the, the, this just begs the question again. Like, it's, it's not... There's something happening, like, in the... In the in a, in, not, not necessarily in the psyche, but in the collective behaviour of these parts of society, the, the media, 
maybe academia as well, although they are doing a little bit a bit better at at least the student body is much, much better, right? They are the 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 the, the locus of, of of resistance to this. But in general, like the way the public discussion, the public discourse works, it is so outrageously um filled with obvious and proven lies. And I know that you've worked on other things as well, like the 40 beheaded baby story that came out right after September, uh, October 7th last year. And, you know, people like Joe Biden telling, saying into the camera that he saw these pictures, which we know didn't never existed. Therefore, he never saw. But he still said so. And it's proven. It's proven. It's like black on white. And. So still, how does this, in your view, function yeah. psychologically? Yeah, I think it's interesting, like, uh, in respect to this Maccabee event, I don't actually understand, because, like, it's so crazy. It's such a, you know, w whatever genius thought they'd put the full team to work on this one, bringing in the the, the king of Holland, Holland uh, King Willy, to, you know, uh, talk about uh, Kristallnacht and what have you. Uh, it was a, an absolutely dopey idea. Uh, so I don't know what their underlying agenda there is, but I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, the, you, you mentioned that story, uh, which is a year old now, uh, they, uh, 40, I, I, I wrote 40 beheaded babies survived the Hamas attack. And it, uh, that, that, uh, that, that what we knew uh, at the time was this was preparation for a genocide, right? You know, like when you think October 7th happened, all the terrible things, you know, uh, that happened on October 7th, all the things that uh, should be condemned and are condemned and all, all of that. But what we knew at the time was something truly terrible was about to happen. So when the story of the beheaded babies came out, and I, I presume most people have heard them, you know, uh, you, you had uh, people like President Biden, as you said, going, oh, in all my years. In all my years, I never dreamed I would live to see such a thing as this, to actually see behead, a terrorist behead babies. That's what he said. Now, the, the White House, I don't know why, they actually retracted it the same day. You know, I mean, Joe is known as a serial fabulist. He does like to make things up, but I'm, I'm really surprised they, even the White House decided it was too outrageous and they rolled it back the same night. But that story went, viral it absolutely caught fire and so you had uh, within um a, very, a day or so you had uh a baby some babies to 40 40 bed uh, you know and what, what an american actor prominent american actor uh, posted to his 25 million followers that um uh 40 uh babies were beheaded and burnt alive I don't know how those two things work, uh, in, in, in front of uh, their parents, right? Now, that went viral. It exploded everywhere. I had people shouting that at me when I uh, tried to stand, stand up for what was about to happen to the Palestinian people. And the reason uh, horrible lies like that get told is when the truth just obviously isn't enough. Horrible lies like that have always been terribly important if you're trying to soften the ground, if you're try trying to prepare the context for something truly horrendous. And that's that's really what's going on here. So I think uh, the Maccabee Tel Aviv thug story, that's trying to elicit sympathy for uh, a people who are committing genocide. And the beheaded baby story was to prepare us to prepare us to, to have a hatred of Hamas, to have a hatred of the Palestinian people, uh, to see them as these barbarians that really needed to be stomped on, and that that's that's a that's that, that's unfortunately a fairly standard propaganda. Yeah, that's a very good observation, and you can clearly see how these blatant and obvious double standards that the West by now is so infamous for are at full work here, right? That for the story of 40 beheaded babies, like the fake story, the fake story of 40 beheaded babies elicits that outcry and the real story of six or 7,000 killed and burned alive babies in Gaza doesn't even like nobody, I mean, nobody cares. There's, there's every once in a while, like there's the dissident 
uh, news like pearls and irritations and so on who write about that but the new york times and so on they they just tick it off as like unfortunate collateral damage you know it's what happens in war it's unfortunate but well you know at the end of the day it's hamas it's mistake that this happens so the blood of the babies is on the hands of hamas hmm. um it, it, it's still it's still bothers me in a sense that even though I know that the art of politics is the art of controlling the current six weeks narrative, that it is that easy to enlist all of these uh, journalists and pundits and the Twitterers and so on and create that fake outrage that's then enough in order to, again, again create the um, victim narrative that you need yeah, in order to I, be justified think... to fight against this fake Goliath. And I think that the, the, the job for people like us is to try to get all of us much better at, at seeing through the, the, those narratives, because the reality is the BBC wasn't naive about the Maccabee Tel Aviv fans. You know, they, they, they've they travelled Europe. They've said, These guys riot everywhere. They're absolute, yeah, you know, uh, uh, shockers wherever they go. Uh, there was a, a job done. And the BBC, you know, for some terrible reason, has decided it's a propaganda outlet, not a news outlet. And um, uh, you touched on a thing uh, just then about uh, uh, the, the the number of dead and uh, of children, uh, real children who died in Gaza. Well, you know, it's probably in the tens of thousands. Like yeah. according, to I, the- I was just talking about babies, like less yeah. than a year or a year and a half old. And yeah, the, yeah. the children it, is already in the in the in the tens of thousands. It's like it's it's insane. Yes, that's right. No, no, that's that that's abs- a- absolutely right. And um, uh, th- that lack of proportionality, like uh, so, 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 five soccer hooligans, I presume they were hooligans, uh, are, are getting beat up in in uh, Amsterdam is the biggest story in the world, apparently. Well, hey, can I can I just share another one with you that's happening now? You know, like uh, B fifty two bombers. You know that the, these were the terror of Vietnam. These these B fifty two bombers. Um, they they are flying from America, refueling in Australia, and flying on and delivering these enormous payloads in Yemen. Did did, did you know that, Pascal? No. no. Yes, and I, I suspect a lot of people don't because uh, uh, the biggest story in the world turns out to be some head butters from Tel Aviv uh, uh, getting the kicking they probably deserved. Um, not that I condone violence. Um, uh, and, and yet, at the moment, the British British jets are attacking uh, Yemen with the support of Australia and New Zealand targeting experts. Uh, B-52 bombers are refueling in Australia before they do these big, you know, bunk, uh, bunker busting bomb raids uh, to blow up uh, uh, storage facilities in Yemen. Uh, you know, so they're trying to smash this Houthi blockade that that's uh, done so much damage to the Israeli economy. And I would have thought that's a bigger story. You know, I would have thought that that was a bigger story. So the especially when it comes to Israel, we have a lot of this um, these kind of examples of blowing out of proportion one incident while downplaying the others uh on the on the other side and this is what doesn't fly anymore in the global south because it is too obvious it's too blatant also for you and i we would have had problems getting these kind of stories 30 years ago let's say back in the 90s but now we are watching a channel side live streamed on twitter and 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 all the platforms that still allow act like depicting of the bloody reality that we live in and not all do some of them like immediately ban your videos if you show how people get blown up because uh, you can you can claim that 40 babies were beheaded but if you if you see an actual baby dying then that is that will be censored um but it, this isn't this is old isn't it this is a typical western way of of making wars possible with a population that believes that they stand on the right side of history yes and, and it's it's mobilizing people like the the the, the one uh 
uh, you know, you brought up the 40 beheaded babies. Oh, and by the way, I was absolutely terrified when I wrote that story. So I wrote that story uh, in October last year. So October 7th happened. And, and that story was published the same month. And I was frightened because, you know, like it's pretty serious to challenge a charge like that. And every day I'd, I'd go to Haaretz, the Israeli uh, news platform, and that, that, that they, they were releasing the names, uh, nationality, ages, jobs, et cetera, of, of the, the people who were killed. Uh, on October 7, um, you know, uh, many civilian victims, uh, hundreds of uh, Israeli soldiers and stuff like that. And I, I was checking every day to see the ages and stuff. And, and you know, it, it, it were terrible things happened that day. I'm not, I'm not trivial, trivializing any of that. But what was quite clear was the, the whole narrative about babies. The, I, I think in the end, there may have been like a two-year-old or a three-year-old Amongst yeah, there the was dead. a toddler among the yeah, among yeah, the victims yeah, of was, October you know, seven. Yes. Who, who who killed the child is, is obviously is still open to debate, uh, and this is just unfortunate. Like I saw a colonel of the IDF visited uh, Kibbutz Berry, one you know, which was where a, a lot a lot of victims, you know, a lot of people were killed, uh, and uh, he, he apologized for it the fact that they did actually fire tank shells and stuff into houses. So, you know, we, we, we know uh, war, war and, uh, does tend to generate uh, civilian casualties on, on both sides, which is, which is obviously horrific. Uh, but yes, the, the, um, this, this business of babies. Oh yeah. So, so, so actually in, in the end that was proven correct. A and what's interesting is uh, the babies get used a lot, you know, like uh, we when, uh, it, it made me think of another very famous event, uh, which I think you know about the incubator babies yes. in, in Kuwait. Now it's worth remembering that that was 1990, Kuwait City, and uh, Saddam Hussein had gone in there, and America wanted to deal to him, and uh, they had congressional hearings. And I saw this, I saw this back then, and it was absolutely riveting. You know, there was this um, really uh, lovely uh, young Kuwaiti woman, Na Naria, who uh, testified in front of uh, this, this congressional, all these uh, US congressmen and all of that. And at the start of it, uh, Rep uh, Porter, who was the chair, uh, said, right, media, media, uh, you're allowed to use her, her, her first name, Na Naria or Naria. Uh, 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 but you must not use the family name to protect the family. Uh, so that's the that must be respected, which the media duly did respect. And then she told this astonishing story of of uh, she she was a nurse in the neonatal unit at Kuwait City Hospital uh, the day that uh, Iraqi soldiers came in, and uh, these monsters uh, came in. And they uh, took the, I think it was 90 or 92 babies out of these incubators and threw these little mites onto the floor. And then they stole the incubators and whoop, off they went. And, uh, uh, you know, just just absolute horror story. And understandably, young Nadia, as she's telling it, was very tearful, et cetera, you know, very understandable. And a uh, reporter at the end of it, uh, very much like Joe Biden about the head of babies, he used the same sort of, he said, oh, in all the years and all my years doing this job, you know, I've never heard such a, a story of infamy and barbarity and, you know, et cetera. And, and it was a great story, apart from one minor detail, it was all a complete fiction. It was all completely made up. And everybody, including Naria, has now admitted this, the, you know, because uh, 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 the reason they didn't want to uh, uh, use her, protect her family was because her family name was Al Shabar. And she was the daughter. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to Washington. She was a young Kuwaiti princess. And as she admitted later, she never worked in the hospital. She never seen anybody uh, th throw a baby out of an incubator, let alone ninety of them, and you know all of this stuff. And and then it emerged later on that uh, um, uh, a PR firm in Washington called Hill and Knowlton had actually made the whole thing up as a sort of a bit of a vehicle to uh, to 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 create a bloodlust, create a bloodlust in, uh, in the American population so that they would 
uh, enable the best of the best of the best of the best to get out there and do what they do best, which is slaughter men, women and children in vast quantities, which the Americans, you know, uh, very quickly did and killed hundreds of thousands of people. And, and then a bit further down the track imposed uh, uh, sanctions and uh, um, uh, that's which led eventually to somebody asking uh, Madeleine Albright whether uh, all these hundreds of thousands of real children, not, not indented ones, uh, these real children had died. Was it worth it? And she said, yes, I think it was. It was a price worth paying. Welcome to our world. There, I mean, we know this mechanism. This is, this is clear to you, to I, to the people who watch this channel. Um, that propaganda is the way to power and is the way to war. Um, the question on my mind is, why do so many people unquestioningly follow this? I would understand if an 80, 19-year-old who is told to read, you know, the big newspapers that are, they use difficult words, but they, they help you with your understanding, and you're a big boy and a big girl if you read, you know, the New York Times, that they would automatically believe that, okay, this is like, you know, the Holy Bible of journalism. And then, you know, the, the Washington Post and and the Guardian in the UK. And I mean, every country has their two or three leading newspapers and magazines. And then you hear all of those important sounding words and you're, you're impressed. And, and obviously, if it's in the press, it must be true. Right. But but then you grow older and you reach maybe your 30s or so. And you you realize that you've been lied to time and again. And yet and yet a good part of the population goes along with it. And when you say like, oh, I, I have my doubts about the 40 beheaded babies, you get an outcry of people telling you, how can you? You must be a monster. Because obviously the, you, the president of the United States said it in front of a camera. How dare you? Can you explain to yourself that reaction of a good part of the population? Not everybody. It's a good part who doesn't, but there's still a too big part that does react like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well. well uh, I'm I'm not a communist, but some some commie bastard said some years ago. Um, the uh, it was actually Karl Marx. Uh, the the uh, the the dominant ideas in society are those of the ruling class, and it's it's a simple idea. It doesn't matter what society you're talking about, any any century, any time. The dominant ideas in society are those of the ruling class. And so we, we, we've lived in this world where, you know, the likes of the BBC and the uh, CNN and New York Times and all of that, they've had this grand old run, right? But we live in a changing world and uh, uh, things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. Uh, that, that what's actually happening is from the periphery. Change, change always comes from the periphery, just ask the Romans. Um, at, and uh, what's actually happening is there's a lot of challenges going on at the moment, and some of them are very big, you know, on the geopolitical front, the likes of the rise of China or the re-emergence of the Russians, the uh, the whole rise of the global south, you know, where, where, where the uh, uh, GDP of the south is actually growing at a surprising rate. And so those sort of things are happening, and at the same time, the narratives are starting to be more effectively challenged, and I, and I think Pascal, you do a, an outstanding job. You're you're part of the uh, changing world, the 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 the, the world that is slowly uh, taking shape, and where we don't believe their narratives quite like um, we used to. And I, I I think that's really really important, and it's really good and quite inspiring. Uh, you know, that's why I love seeing to, you know, actually seeing people really rip into that uh, narrative over the last few days of uh, getting us back to uh, uh, Amsterdam. It was just so refreshing to see so much energy immediately piled into countering that 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 very false narrative. And, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, the more people who refuse to buy into that stuff, uh, the better we'll all be. And the only thing that side will have left, the other side will have left, is to accuse everybody of anti-Semitism. But as, Lou, as 
it, it's losing it's losing its power i mean it this this charge is becoming like transparently stupid and luckily we're also learning how to counter it by actually differentiating between jews and zionists and make sure that we call out the the toxic ideology and not the legitimate well founded and absolutely a good faith of these good people that that we don't we definitely just should protect right but the zionism is what we can call out the the question still remains then to any kind of viewer who watches this and doesn't have time like you and i to read like to read three hours a day uh newspapers and compare twitter feeds uh how do you maintain a normal life um knowing that what you read in the big newspapers is a, to a good part bollocks some part not, some part is, but that's what makes it difficult, right? So how do you create, how are you a literate media consumer without being a media expert? What's your um, recommendation? Oh, I see. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Hey, you touched on a good thing there, that that uh, the mainstream media do a lot of great reporting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's part of the genius of it, really. Like, I mean, I've, I read uh, New York Times recently, you know, a year or so back, I did a, just an incredible series of articles on high tech, you know, the country high tech. I mean, just, just absolutely fantastic. The Guardian often does really terrific reporting. Um, but that's, uh, that, 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 but when it counts, boy, they, they, they you know, they, they play their role in, in try, trying to keep, uh, uh, Things moving the way that the US and Israel and the like want want it to. Um, in terms of, I, I think you've you really yeah. answered your own question in a way, Pascal, because I think the big trick is for everyone to uh, reach out a bit more. So maybe don't consume more news, just consume different news. You know, like I I'm I, I, I'm always encouraging people and sharing news sites with people and say, hey, uh, like instead of watching, uh, you know, sure, watch BBC, sure, watch uh, uh, CNN, whatever. But for goodness sake, make sure you watch a bit of uh, um, uh, Middle East uh, Monitor, uh, Jadalia, uh, Al Jazeera, you know, other news sorts. Really fill your mind with, with, with a broader range. I mean, I want to, you know, I'm appalled at these people who want to shut down everybody who isn't a, a sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, like, uh, how about we have a few more Russians on, uh, why don't we actually hear what they've got to say? Why, why you know, I'm, I'm not a Putin fan or anything like that. I I just think I, I we it, we live in a healthier world when uh, where uh, we actually hear a range of opinions and we uh, we hear what the Houthis have to say. Why why do we never hear from them? Why why is it that you know really really interesting a analysts uh, uh, or like Maureen Rabani, you know, uh, 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 um, or even John Mearsheimer and people like that. You know, why 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 are they why are they sort of absent from our media? Why is Muhammad uh, Sayed Morandi absent from our mainstream media? It's ridiculous. Let's hear, let's hear all of these opinions. Yeah, okay. Diversity, diversity, but also the, the, the recognition that you can't trust anyone not even entirely yourself because you might be wrong, right? So you need to you need to have a healthy dose of distrust while not despairing about, oh, everything is relative, I can't know anything. I mean, there is some truth out there, but it's up to us to to go and and figure it out. Nice, nice. Yeah, and, oh, and I think that actually this very mature response, I must say, but even doubting yourself, because, you know, it's the the old idea about the the blind man and the elephant, you know, uh, the, the the truth that no, no one person can sort of grasp the totality of reality. So that's why it's good to bring a lot of opinions in and, 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 and to question your own perspective. Because, you know, because a lot of this, yeah, perspectivism is a very good idea, you know, to say, well, Actually, here I am sitting in Wellington and I live, a, you know, in a lovely place. And, you know, I've got a particular uh, experience that, that has shaped my worldview. And I suspect that will be quite different from somebody who's um, sitting in uh, Sana uh, mm. or, or Gaza uh, receiving uh, all sorts of instruments of death at the moment. They all have a very different uh, experience from me, and I'd like to hear that experience. 
Yes, yes, and make sense of it. I think this is a, this is a great way to um, to also end our program today with a, on a hopeful note that we can that we can parse through the propaganda, do our own counter propaganda in order to deliver these points. So um, I would encourage everybody to find Eugene Doyle. Uh, he publishes regularly on pearls and irritations. I'll put that into the description. Anywhere else where people can follow you, yeah, Eugene? Sure. Uh, so so I, I think pearls and irritation in Australia, that they're, they're really outstanding. Uh, definitely worth checking out. That's a big, uh, big uh, site. Uh, a counterpunch in the US, I'm, I'm regularly on, on that. And my own uh, platform where you can read all my articles is solidarity.co.nz, New Zealand, yeah, NZ. Uh, but hey, thank, thank you, Pascal. It's been a real, real privilege talking to you. Thank you very much for, for all of your reporting. And people, please check out Eugene Doyle. Um, everything will be linked. Eugene, thank you very much. Uh -huh.